Parks in Bayer und We didn't throw a hat on top of it saying this is an estimation technique that we're invoking. 
So instead of matching this to true P, we don't know it, we call it something different. So that's now our estimator. So we'll call that the estimator. If I plug data into this, real data, I would call it an estimate. So that's the distinguishing quality between those two things. The estimator is the function itself. What we would end up with is P hat is equal to X offs over K. So that's just the number of successes over the total number of trials. And so nothing horribly went wrong there. I like that estimator. I like it for all kinds of different reasons. We'll talk about those reasons once we cut through a few more examples. Um, I could have done the same thing with the negative binomial. So I could have batched y off to this quantity x 1 minus p hat over p hat. And I could solve for p hat. And what we end up with, well, let's just do it, do the algebra. So this is going to be y off over x. We can call that off if we want. is equal to 1 over p hat minus 1. So that's a different way of writing that. I could add that 1 to both sides. And I could invert this thing to solve for p hat right there. So this isn't too tricky. So that's just going to be x offs over x offs plus y offs over x offs. And so we can combine everything. So this is going to be x offs. Well, I'll just write it down the easy way. This is x offs over x, the number of successes plus the number of failures. And I could have just called this thing right here k. So we get back the exact same estimator that we got here. We've assumed different things, and nothing went horribly wrong, but I made this claim that we violated the likelihood principle. And where did we violate it? We didn't use it. But what Sam might be thinking is, well, they have the same likelihoods, so this is a consequence of that, and it's not. So this is a coincidence. So and I want to talk just a little bit more about that through a different example in a moment. But let's just hold that in our back pocket and think, maybe we violated the likelihood principle, and maybe that doesn't sit well. So I think another example would be useful here. We also looked at the, the maximum likelihood estimator. So the MLE just came from maximizing this likelihood function. So the nice thing about these two different probability models is they have the exact same likelihood. So these things are equal to each other. But they're off by some normalizing constant. And so I could just write that down and see here. We look at the MLE and take the likelihood function for P. I'll write it down conditional on X and Y. Maybe odds to distinguish it from the random variable. And this is just equal to, I'll just write down proportional to P times X odds. One minus P times Y odds. So I don't want to take derivatives over that and set it equal to zero. I want to linearize the equation. And so a good trick for doing that is taking a logarithm. And so we can do that because it's a monotone function. So the same thing that they taught you in calculus class many years ago. It works here as well. So if I want to maximize this, Maybe thinking about what this thing looks like in some function, I'll call this the likelihood. This is a function of p, and maybe it looks like that. So I'm kind of assuming that these numbers might have been large enough so that this bent over. And we've seen that evolve, but the likelihood could be a straight line. It could have gone this way. But after I collect more and more data, it starts to look more and more normal. We've seen that behavior before. And so what I want to do is I want to figure out where this is maximized right here. So this point is the MLE. So it's the point that maximizes that. And so we can solve for that by looking at the law of likelihood. And 
this thing is going to be equal to, if you'd like, I'll write down log C just to be pedantic. We already know that it doesn't matter what happens once we take a derivative over a constant, that's zero. So plus x log p plus y log 100. Let's be consistent and call those the observations. There's my log likelihood function. I can take a derivative over that. So taking a derivative wouldn't have helped us there. So that would be a case where you'd have to check the endpoint. So what we're going to do is we're going to set this thing equal to zero and solve for p. So x ops over p hat, so I'll change the name of that, minus y ops over 1 minus p hat. We're going to set that equal to zero. And we already know what the answer is. We've done this map identically right over here. So this is going to be p hat is equal to x ox over y ox plus x ox. So same answer again. We asked this question, did we violate the likelihood principle? Well, we used the likelihood function to get this. So I guess we didn't. And that would be the typical argument. The problem with the likelihood principle itself is what it says is that the likelihoods are proportional to each other for two different distributions, that's the case here, then you should come up with the same inferences. And there's a lot buried in that word should. So it assumes a lot, it assumes we're gonna operate under the same procedures and give you the same inferences. So I think that's a huge assumption in itself. Look at one more type of estimator, the Bayesian estimator. Which we didn't quite get to last time, but we've seen it many times already in this course. So you're operating on this on the upcoming simulation study. So exactly the same sort of problem. So the Bayesian is going to construct a posterior distribution. That's the posterior. And how are we going to derive this? We're going to derive it via Bayes' theorem. So that's going to be the likelihood function. Times a prior distribution on Q. Divided by the integral. So everything in the denominator is just some number. So I'll just remind us this is not a function of p. We're integrating over p, and it's normalizing this equation. So that's basis theorem. So I can just forget about this for a while, because it doesn't tell us about the functional form involving p. And I can just study the numerator. And so the numerator is this p to the x ox 1 minus p to y ox. I can put down some normalizing constant right there. I've been trained to forget about it. So 
So just think about the number. <coughs> so time sum prior. And since we only know one class of priors right now, i.e. conjugate priors, so maybe we're inclined to use one of those. I'll give you a heads up. The conjugate prior in this case involves every optimal answer. So there's more reasons to invoke a conjugate prior than just saying it's convenient for us to do and it's the only way we know how to do this. So in a full-blown Bayesian class, we would talk more about those reasons. So the optimality that you can see using these priors, especially in one-dimensional examples. Bless you. So the conjugate prior is the beta in this case. And the beta distribution looks like some constant. So times p to the alpha minus 1, 1 minus p to the beta minus 1. So it involves two parameters, which the Bayesian refers to as hyperparameters. <coughs> So I reform this and I write it down in some simplified way. I'm going to get rid of my normalizing constant there. We've already got rid of this normalizing constant. So once I throw one away, I might as well throw them all away. This will look like p times x obs plus alpha minus 1, 1 minus p to the y obs plus beta minus 1. And we recognize what this distribution is. This is a beta distribution. More specifically, it's the density function. And so the specific beta this is involves these two objects. So this is x ox plus alpha y ox plus beta. So the Bayesian is going to say this is their full inference. So they're going to give you a full function describing what you think P is. But there's a lot of choices on how to pick an actual estimator out of this. One such estimator that's common for people to pick is the mean. And we know what the mean looks like. So the mean for this just going to be whatever this thing is divided by the sum of those two things. So this is going to be x off plus alpha over x off plus y off plus alpha plus beta. This estimator right here is not the exact same estimator that we came up with before, but it's very similar to it. And if we end up seeing more and more samples, if the x obs was very large, it would dominate whatever that constant alpha is. So to do a full-blown inference, I'm going to have to pick values for those hyperparameters. And x plus y is going to be increasing as the sample size increases, so it's going to dominate alpha and beta. So asymptotically, they're the same estimators that we're getting. But conditionally, they are slightly different. And I want to just ask this one question. Did we violate the likelihood principle? Chris says yes. How did we do it? Yeah, I was a little confused when you said we violated it before because the inferences were the same. Yes. Yeah. The inference the opposite. Yeah, but they're pretty close. Yeah. There's some form of equivalence. So the question is, is the likelihoods were the same whether or not I was using the negative binomial or the binomial, I would have come up with the same distribution. So in that sense, the inferences are the same. Um, now, um, so it seems to me that you did use the likelihood to get this one. Um, how, but you did get a different inference from someone who was using maximum likelihood distribution. Yeah, that's so right. So, my question is though, how can you tell, oh, couldn't you, could you not say, since you have different uh, inferences in terms of your estimate, uh, you could say that they violated the likelihood. Not you. Yeah, and they could say it back to you. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say because that word should assumes that the two experimenters or the, the two groups are going to use the same estimation procedure. So it doesn't tell you what you're going to do with the likelihood. And that's the part 
that I think is not sound in the, the statement of the likelihood principle. I do like the part of the likelihood principle that says we want to condition on the data and we want to use the data in a sufficient manner. So those seem like good things. So I like that stuff and likelihood functions subsume that automatically. Um, the answer to this question is contentious if the Bayesian violated the likelihood principle. If we assume that everybody's going to pick the same priors for the same reason, you didn't. But you can't have used the likelihood to derive the prior. So because you've doubled it the likelihood. And all of this is very unsatisfying. These are the typical answers you'll hear to, to various arguments. So if we all agree on the alpha and beta that we're going to pick, and we have lots of different reasons for it, maybe we're violating the likelihood principle, or maybe we're not. So it's hard to say. So it really depends on, I think the answer is, it depends on how you thought about this prior, and how you derived it in the first place. So if we just said, I'm a subjective Bayesian, and I just have a priori beliefs, and everybody's allowed their own personal a priori beliefs, and you pick yours and I pick mine, and we're just going to come up with slightly different inferences based off of that. Um, is that a violation of the likelihood principle? And the answer is, I don't know. So if it is, or who violated it. So, um, and that feels very unsatisfying as well. So it doesn't really discuss how you pick the prior in the first place. And that's the part that never settled well with me. So really, violations of the likelihood principle are more about how you thought about the estimator rather than what the estimator is. And that might be the part that troubles us the most. So philosophy is designed to do that, to make you frustrated. So it makes you think about things. I've been thinking about this for about 22 years now, and I still grapple with it. So when I think to myself, does it really matter in the conclusion I've come up with? As long as you're using the data in a conditional form and you're invoking the sufficiency principle, those are good concepts. And that's where I kind of backed out, and that's my likelihood principle light. And so that's the one I really subscribe to. Um, at the end of the day, did it really matter? We came up with very similar estimators, if not the same estimators. And so in this example, it doesn't matter what happens. And I think that's pretty unsettling for people as well. Um, let's look at another example and see what could possibly go wrong. So I want to jump the gun in this chapter and kind of jump back and forth between concepts. And what I'd like you to do is start reading through chapter seven. So a good place to, if you want to just warm up, you know, is Kramer Rapp. Now that's probably not the best place. Probably read through the examples that they're giving you. And I'll make sure that I double check this to make sure that you know what the examples in the book are. What did I just say? Read the book because on the next midterm, I'm going to pull an example straight out of the book and put it on the midterm. So I'm going to know instantaneously if you've checked all those examples. When you say example, you mean literally the example? Yes. Yeah, exactly. The, the bold example 4.3.2 or whatever it is. Okay, here's another example. So I don't always like to just argue through philosophy. I like to see examples paired with philosophies. So here's another example. Let's say I've got XIs. They're IID coming from a uniform distribution on minus theta to theta. So let's just go through what we know so far and apply the exact same techniques to derive some estimators. Let's look at the moment of phase estimators. So this is called bomb estimation or the method of moments. So what the method of moments really says more in general is that you match some of the moments to each other. And it doesn't tell you exactly which moments that you might match. But the moments you match in will make your estimation unbiased in that moment match. Let's see what happens if I end up just matching the first moment, i.e. the mean. What's that? Can anybody do the calculus? 
zero. <laughs> so, if you want to think about this, minus theta is there, theta is here, probability distribution. So, zero is in the middle. If you've ever taken a physics class, this is the point where you would touch your finger to balance this board right here. So, the center of gravity is the first moment to a statistician. So, and the second moment has to do with the variability. The ability to, if I put my finger right here, the ability to swing this thing around. So, we'll look at that in a second. So it's zero. So I'm gonna do some matching and I'm gonna say, well, I guess theta is zero, right? I don't even know what to do with this. There's no theta in here. So, this is useless to us. So this is theta. The failure of the method itself. So I have nothing to match, it doesn't involve theta. So that's kind of a bar. So what I could do is I could maybe match the second moment. So maybe I'll just scale up, build a different moment, and try to match this. Does anybody know what this second moment is off the top of their head? Yeah, there's a 12 in there. We all remember the 12, but we're, we learn this stuff usually with the, the uniform 0, 1, so we forget what the numerator looks like. So, I'll just point out that the variance, just real quickly. So the variance of this is equal to the expectation x squared minus the expectation of x. All squared. We already know what that is. That's 0. So we're in a little bit of luck. The variance is the second moment in this example. And so I'll just remind us that if I have some random variable, which uniformly distributed between, I'll say, A and B, then the variance of Z is going to be B minus A squared. So it really doesn't matter which way you did that. Divide by That's that 12 that we're all remembering. So this is going to be 2 theta. That's the interval length. Squared divided by 12. So this is going to be 4 theta squared over 12. So we are pretty close. So I heard some sixes, I heard some fours, I heard some threes. Did anybody say the correct thing? Did we hear the three? Maybe not. Oh, Sidey passed it. So good job. So there's an epsilon for you. So what do we do with this? We match to something. So I'm going to match x squared right here, which is just theta squared over 12, and I'm going to match this to the empirical second moment. That's going to look like this. So maybe I have n samples coming from everything. So this is the empirical second moment. So just in general, expectation of xp can be approximated with this. So that's the empirical moment. So it's just the average of it. So it's a really easy thing to do. So we can do the exact same, with, same thing with this and solve for it. So this is going to be sum of the xi squared over n, oops, 3. So times 3 is equal to theta at squared. So I can take the square root over the top of this. And that's my estimator. 
Do we like that estimator? It's okay. So it's not totally unreasonable. I didn't have to think about um, necessarily which route I need to take. So I'm going to assume just by the problem I set up that theta is positive. So it's just by the way I've written everything down. So I probably needed to say that up here. But I think it's obvious by the way I do it. Okay, so this estimator does have a property that it's unbiased in the second moment. So that's kind of cool. We could derive that specifically if you want to go through the trouble. You can do that. But you shouldn't be surprised at the end of the day, since we match that moment, that it is unbiased in that moment. Is it unbiased in the first moment? No. There's no guarantee. I could have just come in and said my estimator for the whole thing is just zero. I guess I could have said that, and that's unbiased. But I don't use the data in any sophisticated way. So my variability is I start moving away from zero. If the answer is something different from zero, the answer gets terrible. So, and we'll look at that a little bit later. So this is maybe an okay estimator, but we probably need some principles that help us to know whether or not this is an optimal estimator. And that's what chapter seven is all about. So let's just look at another estimator that we could have formed. We could have looked at a likelihood-based estimator. Given all of my x's, I'll call that cap x. So that's just x1 and xn, i.e. our whole sample. And this thing is going to be proportional to something. I can multiply the likelihood by a positive constant, and it's still the likelihood. So if you're ever touching likelihoods and you don't use them in a ratio sort of form, you're making a mistake. So the likelihood function for this is going to be the product. 1 to n, I'll write down 1 over 2 theta. So that's what the, the density function looks like. Times the indicator function with the xi's lived between minus theta and theta. We notice that this part doesn't involve the data. So if I were thinking about the factorization theorem, the part of this equation that I'm staring at is this thing, right here. So I can rewrite this. This is 1 over 2 theta squared. And I can convince myself, just like we've done for our maximum base problem, I can convince myself that the minimum needs to be greater than theta, greater than minus theta, and the maximum needs to be less than or equal to theta. That's the maps. And that's the main. So let me just ask you a question. What's the dimensionality of the minimal sufficient statistic in this problem? Two. Saeed says two. Saeed's almost never wrong. Do we trust him? That's good enough for a lot of people. Let's <laughs> think about it a little bit more. David's puzzled. Staring at this. Thank you. This is controlling the asymptotics of everything. So that is an important part of the likelihood function, but the part that involves the data is the indicator. Did it? I think it might be one. I think if we start by uh, taking the absolute value of all of the uh, x, we will find that it's a lot like the uh, uniform zero theta example. Good insight. So minus theta is here. We know that xn is budging against this point right here, and x1 is somewhere over here. So zero is in the middle. So what David just says is that it's actually the point that's budging closest to the boundary that's telling us where that boundary is. We know what this likelihood function looks like. It looks like this because of the one over two theta. So we understand that function. That looks like this. The maximum is on the endpoint of all of that. 
And the question is, is where is it bounded? The likelihood function looks like this, and then it's bounded somewhere. So it only has one boundary there. And what data just told us is this boundary is defined by the absolute value of these things. We want to know which one is closest to theta, and that's going to be the more extreme value in terms of its magnitude. And so this is going to be bounded by the maximum of x1, absolute value, and x2, xn, maximum absolute value. So how do you think about that? How do you get that right mathematically? I think you have to draw the picture and think about it for a minute as to what's really going on. If you did code this up on a computer and analyzed it, you would see that real quickly, that that boundary is defined by that um, more extreme um, magnitude point from that set of the min and that. I said that really weird, but you know what I mean. Sam? That example we did the other day that was between theta and theta plus one, was that one actually two-dimensional, I think? Yeah, I think because it is. that one, like, you can't, it's not centered at zero, and you don't know where it's centered. Now you know theta. my tricks to all of my tests. All I have to do is move around those thetas in different ways, and I totally reconstruct the problem. So the problem with theta and theta plus one is different from the problem with minus theta to theta, you know, and so on and so forth. So that one is two-dimensional. That was correct. So yeah, they're, they look like the same problems, but they're a bit different. So that's what that looks like. So um, minimal sufficient statistic is one-dimensional in this case. If you're studying my qualifying exams and you've seen the circle problem, this is the one-dimensional analog of that circle problem. So we can talk more about that later. So I've got this different sufficient statistic right here, so it depends. And I can work out whatever one this is and pick that value, and I can work out its probability distribution. But it's a different estimator. So the question is, is which estimator is better? The maximum likelihood estimator or the, the, the moment-based estimator? What do you think? I think you have to define what you mean by best. Yeah, exactly. That is the answer to that question. We have to define what we even mean by best. So they're best in different senses. That's what decision theory is all about. So let me start to wind that part of the lecture up. The part of the book that I don't love is when they hit Bayes in chapter seven and they say the Bayes estimator is the mean. And the way I try to phrase that when I went through it, I said that's one such estimator. And so we have to define our criterion for deriving those estimators in the first place. So we have to define what we even mean by best in the first place. So, and that's maybe a subjective choice. So we might come up with an objective answer to a subjective question. So I think everything in the world is subjective. We need to make choices. So that's the part AI is not going to help us with. So we're still going to have to be in the loop there and say, what criterion are we optimizing and why? So that's the part that I'm really skeptical about with AI, is that it doesn't have the ability to do that. And if we ever build a system that makes those choices, I really worry about how pathological it would be. So something to think about. Um, the Bayes estimator we can talk about, but I'm going to have to give you more properties on priors. I'll just make a note. Note. A typical Bayesian prior might be pi theta is proportional to 1 over theta raised to some power, and I'll just call that power k. So this is called the power prior. And the question might be, which k do I pick, and why? So it turns out, I, you can think of maybe k as a knob to adjust going between different objective criteria. So I might say, give me an estimator that minimizes the bias. And I can tell you which k that is, and I can solve for k to make the estimator unbiased. So I could maybe ask a different question. Maybe I want it to be a minimal variance 
prior. Or maybe I can say I want it to be in the class of unbiased estimators. I want the variance to be minimized. So that will lead to a different answer. So we'll be going through that in this class. I'll just give you a heads up. K equals K equal to two makes this unbiased, and K is equal to three makes it minimal um, variance. So let me rephrase. It makes it minimal MSE, mean squared error. So in that same particular criteria, we might want to um, find the, the optimal answer to it. So this would be a class of estimators we could come up with. Um, there's some reasons to think that this might be the, the estimators based off of the likelihood function are better than an estimator like that. And I've got one reason I can immediately go to, and that's the likelihood-based estimators involve the sufficient statistics. And we can verify this is not a sufficient statistic. So one heads up for what we're going to see in Chapter 7 is that if you're not using the sufficient statistic, you can be beaten pretty easily. So there's lots of ways to, to frame that. We could talk about Kramer route. It doesn't apply in this example. We could all talk about route localization, and it does apply in that example. So this is the tricky part of all this stuff. For different examples, we need different tools. So let's just talk about some of the criteria we might be looking at. Typical criteria. Or providing estimators. Is to look at the expected loss. where the parameters don't define the boundary of the space. 
So that derivative is just going to be 2 times theta hat minus theta. So we'll just say this is a function of x. expectation of 2 times theta half minus theta derivative with respect to theta after I roll the chain rule. So I'm just going to solve for 0 here and maximize it. So derivative of theta with respect to theta is 1. So no need for the chain rule. I can get rid of this 2 as soon as I solve for that. And I can end up looking at the expected value of this thing is equal to theta itself. So I can come back and solve for this thing. So my theta that I would end up picking is the expected value. So if we were thinking about a collection of x's, the expected value is the sum of the xi's divided by n. So we're going to look at that more slowly once we get to the decision theory part of this chapter. So I'm just giving you a heads up of something that we're looking at. So there's other criteria we can look at. I can look at the expected value of the absolute loss. The trouble with this is I can't do calculus. So with that loss function. So and we have to think real carefully as to whether or not we like this loss function over that loss function. And obviously, we're going to be thinking about how extreme values affect us. So people that optimize under this are doing what's called robust statistics. So they're guarding against extreme values. They can really blow this thing up. So which one do we actually like? My argument is, is we really don't know. So for just arbitrary problems, it depends on what you're doing. So again, when people are saying they have something that's optimal, you have to ask them what is your criteria. You have to ask them, did it mean anything to you? Why do you think people always run to MSE? It's probably because it's convenient and we can do calculus. But what it's going to mean is that all of your answers are mean-based, so which might be trouble. So it turns out the estimator that optimizes this is the median. So if you want to look in the book, that's problem 713 in the book. So I often ask about that question on midterms. So write that down as a note, and it takes you through all of that and shows you how to prove that. But keep in mind, you can't do calculus. So we can walk through that during the review session, I think. Um, there's also other loss functions. So I might say I'm going to look at 1 minus the indicator function that um, theta hat is equal to theta. So I'll write it down like this. Theta hat is equal to theta. So if theta hat is exactly theta, I score my losses as a zero. That's going to be a one. One minus that is zero. But if you end up picking any other answer other than theta, I'm going to score you with a loss of one, a constant loss. So wouldn't you like it if I graded exams like that? So if you make one small error, zero, the whole thing. So that seems a little brutal. Yeah, for this one, theta is uh, continuous, right? Yeah, I'm imagining it's continuous, is why it's taking the What are the chances that we're going to be equal to, exactly equal to the parameter? What are the chances? Yeah, Zero. <laughs> so this would be a really bad criterion in a continuous space. So it turns out the thing that maximizes that is the mode. And we can run through that a little bit later. So. But yeah, it's zero. So is the chance that you're actually going to hit that. So the one zero loss is probably a bad criterion to invoke in continuous spaces, but maybe in categorical spaces, bless you, um, maybe you'd want to use it there. So we have to think a little bit about what these different criterions are. Um, I want to point out that all of these are functions of theta, and the loss changes depending on what true theta is. And so, I like to think about simulation studies when I look at these sort of things. 
So, and this is exactly what I'm asking you to look at, but I'm maybe giving you some sort of loss function. Maybe look at the mean and maybe look at the variance, which is what MSE is based off of. So, let's just look at this real quick. MSE, this is just gonna be the expected value of my estimator, I'll call it theta hat minus theta squared. We'll slow down and do this more carefully next time. But this thing can be decomposed into two components. This is the bias of theta hat. This is going to be theta hat minus theta squared. So that's what the bias is. This is going to be the bias squared plus the variance of theta hat, our estimator. How do we prove that? I'm just going to drop in the expected value of theta hat, and I'm going to subtract that thing out, the expected value of theta hat. All we need to prove this is break this into two different terms. So, and then expand the square, you'll get some cancellation in the cross term, and you'll derive exactly that. So we can look at that a little bit later. So there's this trade-off between these two different things. The point is, is that we have to make choices. For everything that we do, we have to think about what this trade-off actually is. Do we want to minimize the bias or do we want to minimize the variance? So we can do one or the other. In some cases, we get a little bit lucky. So I want to look at another example of maybe the normal distribution. So if I were thinking about estimating mu in a normal distribution, so I'll say that's known. To keep the problem simple, I get a collection of XIs from that normal distribution. Everything's IID. I see 10 data points. I can probably convince myself real quickly how to optimize this. And so we get lucky in this example that our minimizer for this happens to also minimize that right there, the variance. Does anybody know the minimizer of that? Yeah, the mean. So theta hat is equal to x bar is an optimal answer there. It's unbiased, so the bias is zero, and it turns out we can prove that it's a minimal variance estimator. And that's where the theory of Kramer Routen helps out. So that's where we're going in chapter seven. That's why all this stuff is important. So we can prove that there's a minimal variance estimator out there, and that this estimator obtains that minimal variance. So kramer rao is a theoretical tool that we can use to prove all of that. Also, what's comforting is x bar is the minimal sufficient statistic. So that's how we couple all of this to chapter six and use those principles to our advantage. Uh, route lateralization tells us that if you're not using a sufficient statistic, we can form a new estimator by taking the expectation of your old estimator and conditioning on the sufficient and that's guaranteed to reduce the variance in your estimator. What that really says in disguise is use the sufficient statistic. So always do that. So that kind of goes back to the sufficiency principle. And maybe you want to think about the likelihood principle as an implementation of all of that stuff. So the likelihood principle helped us because of the sufficiency principle and the conditioning and penalty principle and that estimator would beat this other estimator that I wrote down some time ago using the sum of the second moments. So that's the pathway through chapter seven. So we're gonna go really slow through all of that. There's one more thing that people do. Sometimes you have to ask questions about, well, which theta are we trying to optimize this thing over? And it could be that for certain thetas, you might want different estimates different types of estimators. So this is a whole function over theta itself. So I'll point out this is called risk. And it's a function of theta. So that's the term of this. So these are expected loss functions and the terminology here in the decision theory class is that's the risk function. And it looks like something. And so it could be that I have two different estimators that their risk curves cross each other. And then I have to decide in which part of the space am I going to try to optimize everything. And so then I have to invoke more criteria. Maybe I want the estimator that minimizes the maximal risk. 
So I can think about things like that to constrain this problem so that I can come up with a solution. So again, there's too many choices in all of this when we have to impose constraints on everything. There's also something called the integrated risk, where I put a weight function on the risk. So I look at my risk function, and then I cut some weights on that risk function. So I'll point out that this is the risk function for theta hat, so let me just add some notation there. This involves some estimator. And I could impose some weights on theta, and that depends on, that's gonna model how much weight I wanna put on different parts of theta to influence my answer. And I can integrate over this. I like to call that the integrated risk. And I can look for the optimal answer of the theta hat that minimizes this criteria. Does that seem like something you would wanna do, or would you wanna look at something that minimizes the maximal risk? So I can minimize the integrated risk, the area under the risk curve, or I could look at the highest point on the risk curve and try to find a function that minimizes that. Which one's the better criteria? Yeah, that's the answer. It depends. So I don't know if I would like the answer if I lived next to a dam, let's say in New Orleans, and people said, well, on average, everything should be fine. So I'm going to build my dam so that the average dam is pretty good. So, or I could impose a criteria that says something like, I'm going to look at the maximal risk of all of this, and I'm going to minimize that thing. So I don't want our civil engineers to be doing this average sort of thing. So I want them to shield against the worst case situation. So, but maybe if I were sitting there playing March Madness, and I were building a bracket on Kaggle, and maybe there was a prize, and I did this repeatedly, and there weren't huge losses for me, then maybe I would sit there and say, well, I wanna, at least on average, do pretty good in all these competitions. So that when my friends look at the leaderboard, they see that I'm consistently high, and then periodically, maybe I win. So I might be imposing a different criteria, but it really depends on what you're doing. So you have these people out there that will debate whether or not you should be using the minimax estimators or the integrated estimators. And I really think it's all context driven. So you have to think about the, the nature of the problem. There's another more contentious way to talk about this instead of the integrated risk. It's called phase risk. So, and that used to light people up back in the 60s. Oh no, you're Bayesian. So, where's the Bayesian part? It's right here. So, the Bayesian would call that the prior. So we could optimize in different classes of priors, but really the prior is just weighting how much you value certain parts of the space. So I could maybe do both, and I could say, well, I'm gonna put a lot of weight on very extreme things that could happen. I don't know exactly what's gonna happen. And I could put low weight on things that aren't that detrimental, like a little tiny fissure in the, the dam that you could fix real quickly versus a full bursting of the dam. So, um, I tend to think this is, this is a really cool thing that you could play around with, depending on the context of the problem. But of course, as soon as we start picking this based off our subjective beliefs, we have to argue, depending on the, the context of the problem. So again, the point is, is that there's all these trade-offs, and we're going to have to make choices. And I don't always think that the choice is a mathematical choice. I think it depends on the, the circumstances. That's one of the things I worry about with AI as well is that it doesn't understand the situation that well. And it can't distinguish. All it can do is implement something that somebody coded up in the first place. That's where we're going with all of this. I'll point out that if we are looking at the integrated or the Bayesian risk, the optimal answer in terms of the squared air loss, so we can talk about this as squared air loss, the optimal answer is the Bayesian mean. And so when the book says, the Bayes estimator is the mean. What they meant to say is skip ahead 15 pages and we'll describe it as the best estimator in some situation in the squared error sense. The optimal answer for the Bayesian in terms of that criterion is the posterior median. So where the posterior is defined by that prior. You know, it has that in there, so that weighting function. And the optimal answer right here is the posterior mode. Now, there are cases where we probably all agree, depending, 
and it wouldn't depend on you know what culture we come through. So maybe the normal example is that that problem where we're all trying to decide how to estimate the mean. So a typical Bayesian would use the flat product on everything. In their Bayesian, um, their posterior mean would be x bar. And lo and behold, the posterior median is also x bar. It's the center of that distribution. And the posterior mode is also x bar. So in some cases, it doesn't matter which criteria you pick. And in some cases, it matters a lot. So I wish I could give you a unifying theory to tie it all together. But the answer to a lot of this stuff is it depends. So that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. That's all I got for you. We will work through more examples. And I'll try to generalize at least some of the properties of MLEs that we see in the book. So we're going to back out and do that. I'll try to generalize um, method of Bowman operators. But I think the best thing you can do is just plug away at a lot of examples. So your new homework is already posted for you. So start working through those examples. And they're going to have you compare and estimators. And that's my favorite thing to do in this class. It's just look at the estimators and compare them to each other and see in which um, different way what the, the relative pros and cons are. Cool. That's it. A great weekend. Yeah, you just got, you need it.